Now on the line from the nation's capital is Jason Kenney. He is the Secretary of State for Multiculturalism and Canadian Identity and the Conservative MP for Calgary Southeast. And uh, Jason Kenney, how are you tonight? Very well, thanks, Steve. Glad to have you with us this evening. Uh, your government has announced, of course, that Canada is not going to participate in the 2009 World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa, commonly known as Durban II. How come? Very simply because uh, we concluded that it looked uh, almost certain to be a replay of the first Durban conference six years ago, which uh, was uh, a gong show of intolerance and xenophobia, particularly of the anti-Semitic variety. It was um, it became notorious uh, for open expressions of anti-Semitism. Copies of Mein Kampf were sold uh, by accredited NGOs uh, on a, in accredited areas. There were posters glorifying Adolf Hitler. Uh, there was the revival of the discredited and ridiculous Zionism is racism uh, uh, concept and resolution. Uh, there was a generalized uh, attack on, on the West uh, 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 that was uh, uh, you, you, you completely against, I think, the interests and values of Canadians, the, the, the democratic values of Canadians. Uh, and our view is that Canada can and should obviously participate in any international effort that combats racism or xenophobia. Uh, but should not participate in, sanction, support, or fina finance uh, conferences that, in fact, promote and advance uh, racism, xenophobia, intolerance, and anti-Semitism. And okay, we came to the conclusion that was going to be the, fa the case but, with, the, uh, with the sequel. Okay, but that was then, and this is now. Why are you so convinced? I mean, does it sound like you're prejudging the now because of the then? Yeah, we, we made this decision very deliberately, Steve. We didn't want to prejudge the outcome rashly. Uh, our officials uh, from the uh, relevant ministries attended the preparatory committee meetings for the second Durban conference, uh, and we followed those deliberations very closely. Uh, the advice we got back from those officials was that it, uh, it looked like uh, uh, the uh, opportunity to positively influence uh, the preparatory committee and avoid the a replay of Durban 1 uh, was very, very unlikely because, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Iran was elected to be the vice chair of the uh, organizing committee. That's a country uh, whose leadership is explicitly dedicated to the elimination of the only Jewish country in the world. Uh, Libya, one of the, with one of the poorest human rights re records in the world, uh, was elected to chair uh, the preparatory committee. All of the NGOs who participated in the first Durban conference, including those involved in the most outrageous expressions of anti-Semitism, were automatically re-invited by the preparatory committee to participate in the second Durban conference. Uh, the key meetings were set on Jewish high holidays, making it impossible for either the uh, State of Israel or Jewish NGOs to attend, which is, I think, an obvious expression of bad faith given the history of anti-Semitism at the first conference. And there were a whole lot of other technical issues. Do you think the Israelis wanted to attend? I think that uh, both uh, Israel and, and uh, you can read the speech recently given by the Israeli foreign minister on this subject, and yes, I think uh, sh she was clear that Israel would, would prefer uh, to have a conference that learned from the lessons and didn't repeat the mistakes of Durban 1. Okay, let me find out more about our involvement here, though. According to an Israeli newspaper, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, Canada's decision to stay away may have been influenced by Israeli diplomats. Can you tell us whether that's accurate as far as you know? I was uh, very involved in the decision not to attend, and I frankly don't recall discussing this with uh, any Israeli diplomats. We made the decision as uh, Canada uh, to reflect Canadian values and interests. Okay, but when people say, I can't recall, you know, that sounds to viewers like fudge words. You'll forgive well, my saying that. Well, but, uh, look, okay, let me be, let me be uh, very clear then. Uh, we made this decision uh, based on our own uh, Canadian values and interests uh, without consideration for what other foreign governments were doing. And, uh, and the, the evidence of that, Steve, is that uh, we took this position before any other government in the world did. I anticipate that other countries will uh, decide to withdraw from the Durban process. Uh, and quite frankly, I think our decision has given additional leverage uh, to like-minded countries such as those in the European Union. Okay, fair enough. But is it not okay to say, and yes, we had conversations with Israeli diplomats who are happy that we were not going? Uh, but that, that, to the best of my knowledge, is not true. Okay. Would it be a problem if they did try to influence you? I, I suppose embassies are here, uh, obviously, to communicate their view on issues. But frankly, when we made this decision, Steve, uh, the Israeli government was still committed 
uh, it, itself to participating in Durban. So uh, we made this decision before any other government did, and we were not influenced by any foreign government um, uh, negatively or positively in this decision. We were influenced by the decisions being taken by the Preparatory Committee, uh, which uh, it indicated to us uh, the likelihood of replaying the mistakes mm -hmm. made at Durban 1. I presume that you, at some point in your deliberations, considered going and going just to repudiate what was going on there. Why did you ultimately decide not to go that route? Um, we, we obviously kept uh, that option open, and our preferred route would be to be at an a, a international UN conference on racism and xenophobia uh, as a positive force, and for that conference not to repeat the mistakes of Durban 1. But uh, we ultimately decided that it looked very, that there was extremely high probability based on all of the decisions taken to date, the election of, of Libya, of Iran, the, 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 the reinvitation to the NGOs, the Jewish high holidays being used as the organizational dates, etc. All of those proof points to us suggested that, uh, the, that the, essentially the, the decision, the, the outcome is predetermined. Um, so why and not go and hammer them? Because we don't think it's appropriate for Canada to lend its name, credibility, or resources uh, to what is essentially an organized expression of intolerance. Uh, you know, it gives that kind of process credibility. Canada's withdrawal, Canada particularly as a country, a champion of human dignity and human rights uh, and, and, and tolerance and uh, with a model of pluralism and multiculturalism has a re very special role to play in these things. And our withdrawal at an early, early stage is a wake-up call uh, to, to all of those who are involved uh, that they uh, that uh, we will not tolerate uh, a replay of Durban One. We will not tolerate these kind of open expressions of of intolerance, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism. Okay, let me read you something that the Canadian Arab Federation had to say. You, I'm, I'm sure you won't be surprised by the tone of this, but let me read the excerpt anyway. Canada's outright rejection of the conference sends what the Federation believes is a clear message to the Canadian public that the current government is disinterested in promoting human rights and anti-racism. The very fact that Israel was, quote, attacked at the previous conference indicates that the international community and human rights organizations are in agreement that the occupation of Arab lands, the mistreatment and killing of Palestinians, and the denial of the right of Palestinian refugees to return is in violation of international law and will be condemned and no longer accepted. What's your reaction to that? My first reaction is that release is issued by an organization whose president was participated in the distribution of a brochure during the last Liberal Leadership Convention attacking Bob Ray because his wife is Jewish. Enough said. Well, okay, that's, that's some of what needs to be said. How about if I follow up with this? Do, do you risk sending the message that the Canadian government is only interested in the human rights of its allies as opposed to the human rights of everybody by not commenting further on that? I don't think so, uh, Steve. We, uh, it, goes, <laughs> it should go without saying that Canada... Uh, is a world leader in combating uh, xenophobia and other forms of, of racial intolerance. And uh, that's precisely why we are not participating in Durban II. We do not want to give credence uh, to hatred. Uh, to hatred. And let's not forget, okay, this is not just a theoretical discussion, Steve, that, that Durban I happened days before 9 11. Uh, and there is a connection between these kind of overt, organized expressions of hatred and violence which often follows. And the climate has been created um, for uh, not just to open expressions of anti-Semitism, but violence directed uh, at, 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 at Jewish people for the sake of being Jewish. And w this is not some kind of theoretical discussion. This is not a, just about seminars and roundtables. This is real serious no, stuff. I understand that. I understand. And I, and I don't mean to take away from anything you're saying, but at the same time, we, all, uh, you know, we, we do know there is the expression, all politics is local, and you'll forgive this question, whether or not part of your decision was taken because you knew it would find favor with the Canadian Jewish community. I mean, that might, can, can you acknowledge that might be a part of why you made the decision? Uh, Steve, <laughs> s simply put, this was not a, a political calculation. This was a decision based in principle. I can tell you I was in opposition when the first Durban conference happened. Uh, and I can tell you that, that all of the constituencies in Canada with large Jewish, uh, with large Jewish populations uh, were, were, uh, were represented in the government caucus then and continue to be. Uh, we, uh, we took the position then, in opposition, uh, that Canada should pull out of Durban 1. We no, are being I, consistent. I understand that. I, and I don't mean to suggest that there was no principle behind your decision. Far from it. Uh, what, I, what I'm asking, though, is whether or not there might have been some politics as a part of this decision, too. Uh, I mean, you're in politics. Is that such a 
horrendous thing to acknowledge. Well, uh, of course it's not horrendous to say that politics is in politics, but I think the proof that this was not a partisan political decision, let's put it that way, is found in the fact that our decision ultimately has been endorsed by the uh, spokespeople for the Liberal and New Democratic parties, uh, and by every major newspaper editorial board in the country, uh, with the sole exception of the Toronto Star. I think, I think uh, so 11 out of 12 major newspaper editorials and three out of four parties in Parliament have endorsed this decision, suggesting that it's actually not very controversial and, in fact, I think has pretty broad uh, mainstream support. Okay. Let me broaden our discussion for a second here and ask you, I, I think you and I have talked about this in the past where, you know, you've acknowledged that the Liberal Party generally is the place where most so-called ethnic Canadians um, have a greater and longer standing connection than with the Conservative Party of Canada. And I don't say that only because the Conservative Party has been around for a shorter period of time. And yet you have told me in the past, I think we've got, we Conservatives, you say, have a good story to tell uh, when it comes to the, the history of conservatism and ethnic groups. What is that story? Very simply, it's the, that <laughs> the, the Conservative tradition is the one of uh, uh, op mo the greatest openness historically to um, cultural communities and, and, and ethnocultural minorities. The first non-European uh, Canadian elected to Parliament was Douglas Jung, a conservative at, of Chinese origin. The first black Canadian MP and minister was L Lincoln Alexander. The first uh, Muslim elected to Parliament is Raheem Jaffer, our caucus chair. The first Hindu is Deepak Obrai, a parliamentary secretary to our foreign affairs minister. The first Japanese Canadian elected to Parliament in cabinet is Bev Oda, minister of international cooperation. The first Refugee Act was introduced by a Conservative government, the Diefenbaker government. The Multiculturalism Act was proposed by the, the Mulroney Conservative government, which, by the way, tripled immigration levels over those of uh, the Trudeau government that preceded it. Uh, and so, and, and our party in each of the last three elections has had the highest uh, degree of diversity uh, in terms of this, our slate of candidates. And so, yet, and yet, in spite of all of that, it's conventional wisdom that Liberals and are you know, considered more favorable to the ethnic communities in, of this country than you guys are. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I think it's probably a function of the fact that the Liberals have been in power for longer than we have, and often I think newcomers uh, are, look favorably upon the government in power uh, that, they, that they first meet uh, when they come to Canada. We're, we're, we hope to, to, to challenge a lot of the, and also quite frankly, I think the Liberals have abused, uh, um, have used uh, demagoguery to create false stereotypes. Uh, just today, for instance, in the House of Commons, a Liberal MP accused uh, uh, the government of wanting to, quote, uh, end immigration to Canada uh, because we, we are trying to find a way to resolve the backlog of 900,000 uh, pending applications for immigration, 850,000 of which we inherited from the Liberal government. So even when you try to do something positive for immigration, we are accused demagogically of being uh, hostile, which is, which is patently absurd. Okay, in our remaining moments here, let's talk just finally about Canada's fight against racism. The Durban conference is happening, of course, because they believe at that conference that racism is still a problem around the world, a significant global problem. Do you agree with that? Yes. How big? I, I, obviously, it's a, it's a huge issue. Um, uh, and I think it, anyone can see that, that m many of the violent conflicts we see around the world are, as I said earlier, motivated by, by hatred, often religious and, and racial hatred. We will hear, no doubt, at this conference when it takes place next year, that whites are a significant uh, contributor to the racism of this world. Do you believe that only whites can be racist? Uh, no. You want to fill, that, fill in those blanks a little bit for me more? Well, I, I, <laughs> look, racism, uh, an ex the expression of hatred or the uh, negative characterization of people according to their, their race or ethnicity is, uh, unfortunately, uh, a universal phenomenon. It doesn't, it's not the property of people of any one background uh, uh, or ethnicity. I think that's obvious and, and we need to combat it uh, regardless of what its source is. Do you think whites are unfairly tagged with being racist when in fact racism crosses all color lines, etc.? Uh, I think that, uh, well, I, I don't, I don't uh, think that's generally the case in Canada. I don't think that tag exists. I think most people who who uh, observe uh, these issues realize that we need to combat intolerance and, and expressions of racism r regardless of where uh, they come from. And, uh, and we're very focused on that. In fact, uh, the government has a national action plan against racism uh, and we're focusing increasingly our multiculturalism program on, on doing what we can to combat racism regardless of where it comes from. I don't mean to give you a hard time on this, sir, but I can tell in the way you're answering the questions, you know, 
there's a discomfort in, in, in the answers. And we're still at a point in this country in the 21st century where even discussing racism below the surface is still a pretty uncomfortable thing to do. Isn't that fair to say? Of course it's an uncomfortable subject, uh, Steve. We, I think, <laughs> thankful, it, thankfully, it makes Canadians feel uncomfortable. Um, I think the important thing about racism is we should, we should recognize that it uh, continues to be a reality in our country, but we shouldn't exaggerate it. Uh, we, we need to avoid either extreme, either ignoring it and, and minimalizing it or exaggerating it. it. It is a reality. We need to be vigilant about it. And we need to realize that it's not just old style, um, old fashioned racism, that, that uh, you know, uh, that uh, often uh, there, are, there, are, uh, for, there are tensions between, uh, between different communities. Uh, and we need to work those out in a typically Canadian fashion by turning down the volume, respecting one another, uh, encouraging dialogue, uh, and, uh, and, and ensuring that, uh, uh, that we build a society based on social cohesion that's, that's respectful uh, of our values and our history, like human rights, human dignity, freedom, equality, and the rule of law. Well, one last thing on this. Uh, some people would argue turning down the volume is exactly how you don't get things solved, that it's only by actually confronting these issues that they get dealt with. Your view on that? Again, my view is that I think we need to take a, a moderate approach to uh, the, the fight against racism. That is to say, I don't think it's helpful to be hysterical about it, and nor is it helpful to minimalize it. Uh, we need to confront real actual incidents. Um, and, uh, and I think, by and large, Canada has a, a pretty good track record uh, in this respect. Uh, it's, I can tell you, when I travel abroad, Canada is seen as a kind of utopia when it comes to the uh, to dealing with the inevitable tensions of a very diverse society. I don't think it's it's by any means a utopia, but it's a pretty darn good successful model, uh, and uh, and we should be proud, I think, of the fact that we've been able to maintain one of the highest relative levels of immigration in the world, uh, with a very large degree of cultural diversity, with uh, without the kinds of tensions we see in some other countries. Understood. Jason Kenney, it's good of you to join us on the line from Ottawa tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve.